topic of palliative care in emergency medicine or um, emergency palliative care. Uh, this is a topic that I think is incredibly important and something that um, years ago I got asked to speak to the emergency medicine residents at UW on. And I think, um, you know, we, we want to try to encourage folks to use palliative care, especially primary palliative care in their jobs and in their um, careers and lives. Um, but I think the emergency department is a really special place where things move at a different pace than they do um, on the inpatient unit and on the outpatient in the outpatient clinics for palliative care. And so, um, you know, I think I think my talk did not resonate terribly well <laughs> with them and their sense of how to time some of these conversations and have them um, efficiently in, in the emergency department. So it is so wonderful to have um, kind of an insider um, to, to really uh, to, to share insight and wisdom with all of us on, on how, um, how this might work. So thank you again, Dr. Gibbons. Um, and I'm going to let you take it away. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Annie, for the uh, very warm and generous introduction. And you're stealing some of my fire. Save that for later. <laughs> All right. Um, you'll just bear with me here as I get things set up. Um, I just want to say thank you all for joining me for the Grand Rounds this morning. Um, as Annie mentioned, my name is Matthew Givens. I'm one of the palliative medicine fellows for those of you on the call that I haven't worked with. Um, and to Annie's point, I am a trained emergency medicine <laughs> physician, uh, having completed my residency in June of 2021. So immediately before joining you all here at UW for my palliative care fellowship. No relevant financial disclosures for this presentation this morning. Um, and to just give you a little bit of insight about what I'm hoping to achieve over the next hour as we kind of talk together is first and foremost, I would really love to give you a perception or an insider's view of the emergency medicine perspective. I'm hoping to highlight this morning just some of the training that we go through and how that formulates our approach to patient care um, while giving some insight into the constraints, limitations, and pressures associated with working in the emergency department because, as Annie pointed out, it is a special place <laughs> that has its own special rules. Um, in so doing, I would really like to take a moment to examine some emergency palliative care topics. Um, as you may or may not know, the emergency department touches pretty much every single patient that enters the hospital. And as such, every specialty um, is represented in the cases that we see, and palliative care is no exception. Um, so with that, I would um, like to structure this discussion, or I elected to just structure this discussion as a case-based format. Um, so we can walk through cases that I've, and patients that I've actually taken care of in this setting. Um, and I'm sorry for a Tuesday morning at 8 a.m., but I would really love some participation this morning. <laughs> I really am hoping that this can be a discussion. Um, Selfishly, this is the precipice of me completing my training, you know, and so I kind of view this presentation as my love letter to emergency medicine and palliative care, kind of the two areas that drew me into medicine and keep me here. Additionally, I would really love to leverage the experience and expertise of the individuals on this call. Um, you all have been doing this a lot longer than I have, and I would love to uh, to take part of that knowledge and take that forward for, with me in my practice. Um, additionally, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a unique person in the UW ecosystem, the only one that's emergency trained, also working in the palliative space. So I'd love to share kind of my thoughts and my experience. Um, hopefully I have a few resources that I would like to point you in the direction of that might be helpful should, this, should you find yourself encountering these patients or working in these, this space. Um, and then just would like to point out that this is a safe space. Um, this truly is meant to be a discussion. There are no right or wrong answers. At the end of the day, uh, my goal is hopefully that we can learn something from each other with the goal of becoming better clinicians. 
Um, so before we jump in, and maybe to give you a little bit of space as the coffee's kicking in this morning, I'd just like to um, give you a little bit of background. Um, and I'm going to start with background on myself. <laughs> um, so I was actually first drawn to emergency medicine back in my undergraduate career at the University of Utah. We had this wonderful pediatric clinical research training program where we were exposed, one, to um, enrolling patients into clinical research, but two, um, had some background perspective about basic research methodology and how to go about setting up a structure. The reason, however, that I bring this up is we were embedded in the hematology oncology clinics and the emergency department. Um, and quite frankly, more of my time was actually spent in the emergency department. And this was actually my first exposure to medicine. Um, and it had a lasting impact for me. I really loved the environment. I, I continued my journey going to the University of Colorado for medical school. And I remember entering thinking, I'm going to be a pediatric emergency medicine doctor. You know, this is my home. This is what I know. Um, over those four years in medical school, I had a wonderful opportunity to be a part of our global health track in which I actually went <clears throat> and worked in an emergency department in South Africa, in Kailicha, which is the largest township outside of Cape Town. It was truly a transformative experience to see how emergency medicine was delivered in a completely different setting than I had ever been exposed to. Um, you know, in a different country with different resources, with different expectations from both the staff and the patients that you were seeing. Um, it was truly enlightening, um, which of course kind of led me to my residency in emergency medicine, which I completed at um, Indiana University. Um, I was really fortunate there that when we train, we have a lot of critical care exposure and in so doing, that was kind of my first insight into palliative care. Um, I was fortunate that I actually had mentors in the emergency department that were fellowship trained in palliative care and got to see just how that kind of shaped their practice and what that looked like, which ultimately led me to, um, to here at University of Washington to complete my, um, my fellowship. I remember entering this um, program thinking that, you know, I'd love to, I'm going to carve out a, a career where I can split my time between the emergency department and palliative. And I, unsurprising to, I'm sure a few people on the call just really found a home in palliative medicine this year and have ultimately decided that I will be working from the palliative side, but hopefully strengthening that intersectionality between emergency and palliative care. Um, so with that said, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and speak just to the kind of training and mindset of an emergency medicine physician. Um, hopefully this will kind of give you a little bit of a lens and perspective for approaching some of the cases I have a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but I think one thing that's often very unique to our specialty is we are trained with a worst first mindset, which essentially means that we have to prioritize the life-threatening conditions in any of our presentations. So when I first see a patient, the first thing that comes to my mind are the things that will kill this patient. Because if you don't think about, if I don't think about them, I'm going to miss them and that can ultimately harm my patients. So it's kind of a different mindset. I think we're often trained of what is the most likely, which makes most sense, um, which is kind of the secondary component of our emergency medicine differentials. But we are trained from the beginning to always think, what is the worst case scenario? Um, and I think that's something that kind of carries over into just how we deliver our patient care or how we think about um, the delivery and the methods that we're using. Another kind of strong mindset is your sickest patient. And kind of the emergency medicine mantra is the sickest patient is the one you haven't seen yet. So you're always on the go and you're always worried about the patient that you haven't laid eyes on and made that determination if they are sick or not sick. Another strong component within emergency medicine is the, con the consideration of flow. In the department, you have a constant flux of patients. You have incoming patients from the ambulance bay, from the waiting room, I've even delivered babies in the emergency department. <laughs> so you are getting new patients on the fly all the time. 
um, that is conversely balanced with your dispositions. You are admitting patients to the hospital. You are discharging patients home. Unfortunately, you even have patients that pass away in your emergency department. There's always a balance. And the problem emergency medicine physicians run into is when that flux is weighted too heavily in one direction. So in addition to seeing the patients, knowing the medicine, in the background of your mind, you're still always thinking about the flow and the overall um, workings of your department. Additionally, there is an ebb and flow. Um, we, it would be lovely if we could control how many patients are coming in at different times, but that's just not the case. Um, given that we specialize in emergent conditions, we often have we, what we call boluses of patients. Um, I can't tell you the number of accidents that happen simultaneously where you have multiple patients and often multiple sick patients that arrive all at the same time. Um, we've had multiple shooting events with multiple patients. We've had multiple patients coming in from same exposures, um, chemical incidents, um, CO2 exposure, all, or excuse me, carbon monoxide exposure. And so all of these things influence how my day runs and the delivery of the patients, uh, the care that I can deliver to my patients. And I think the last component about flow is because of that ebb and flow nature, that constant flux of patients, there's always this pressure and the stress for efficiency. As an emergency physician, you are taught, do everything you can as soon as possible. Writing your notes, just write it, prepping your discharge instructions, putting in your admission orders, all of these things are happening as you're seeing new patients, as you're sending patients home. Um, and it just forces you to get really good about getting things done quickly. Um, and then the last kind of component that I, I thought that was really worth mentioning that might be unique to our specialty is what we call the uh, plan C or having a backup to your backup. You know, we are experts in emergent conditions. In an emergency, you always have to have a plan. Um, and I can even say, speak to this firsthand. I promise you when something terrifying or um, emergent comes in, your mind is going to go blank. <laughs> and so one of the elements of our training is how do we combat that? And by um, establishing structures and patterns and on how you approach um, a very critically ill patient or even approach something that you've never seen before, having a framework to work through gives you that sense of stability that keeps your composure, that allows you to um, care for the patient in front of you. Um, and then just kind of going along with that, it's, it's constant maintenance. Um, we oftentimes don't have to, con I can count on one hand um, the number of crikes that I did on a patient, but that's something that I have to be ready for and have to be able to do at a moment's notice. And that's something that you have to practice and think about um, even in your off time. And so one of the things that we were encouraged to do as residents was think about something you don't do often, run through your algorithm, get your approach, and run through it regularly. Uh, so shifting gears just a little bit to, sp to speak to some of the constraints and pressures that you are faced with as an emergency medicine physician, I think one of the biggest um, pressures that we face is time. Um, this is oftentimes reflected by the volume of patients that you can see um, in the emergency department. It, it's not unique, but where I trained in particular, we had um, shifts. And so as a part of that shift work, you receive patients in sign out. So patients that were evaluated and the workup started by your colleagues, in addition to seeing patients that you pick up primarily and that are new to you. Um, just to give you maybe some idea of that perspective, we would work nine hour shifts where I trained and I looked back at my shift logs and I saw a range of patients anywhere from four new patients on a very, very slow day, all the way up to 29 new patients in that nine hour window, where my average seeing about 20 patients a shift was pretty typical. Um, 
in addition to the sign out patients, um, there were times where I had no sign out patients. I would start fresh from the board all the way up to, I remember one shift in particular, I had 52 patients that were signed out to me in the emergency department. Um, on average, it kind of settled around 15 patients. Um, and so just to give you some perspective, if we were going just off of the new patients alone, that gives me anywhere from an hour and a half to a patient all the way down to 18.6 minutes. I did the math for you, um, per, per patient. And if we went off of averages based off of the new patients plus the signouts, I had an on average 15 minutes of my shift that I could spend with a patient. And that gives no time off for snack breaks, for going to the bathroom, or doing any just kind of biological needs that I had myself. Um, in that 15 minutes, I am expected to evaluate the patient, complete a workup, which would include placing my orders, interpreting lab results, placing consults, doing any necessary procedures, including suturing, joint reductions, incision and drainage, or even doing a procedural sedation, documenting my encounter, and then dispositioning my patient. Um, so as you can see, that really is a huge time burden, um, trying to cram all of that in into the space of 15 minutes. Um, another component in the emergency department would be the physical space. Um, where I trained, each patient had individual rooms. However, those were a finite resource. And there were some times where we had to put beds in the hallway and we would create hallway beds. Um, we would also have to board patients when the hospital was entirely full. Those in admitted patients were still in the emergency department and technically a part of our responsibility as well. Um, additionally, I think of the physical space also applying to uh, the personhood of the physician. You know, I am a single person. When I have an ambulance bolus of six patients all arriving at the same time, I can only be in one place at one time. As such, that requires some flexibility that I have to make quick assessments, move on to the next patient, and circle back to complete the workup. Um, which kind of leads me to my next point of task switching, right? This is a dynamic environment. One of the, the core foundational principles of emergency medicine is I have to evaluate each person who, as soon as possible and make a determination of who is sick, who is not sick, and who needs me and my time in that moment. As I mentioned, there are dynamic changes that are happening. That not sick patient can become sick very quickly decompensations are there and you have to make adjustments and be flexible and address the, the, the problems as they arise. Um, oftentimes, I found myself directing care for patients where I was not physically located with them, um, being in the room with my sickest patient, but still moving things forward on the patients that I was responsible for was not an uncommon occurrence. Um, and then Quite frankly, going back to all those tasks we had to do, order entry, documentation, consultation, seeing new patients, these are not happening <laughs> um, consecutively. These are all happening at once and you have to, you have to be flexible and move bet between the variety of tasks. Um, as far as expertise, I think it's really important to know the, the expertise of the emergency medicine physician is in the diagnosis and management of emergent conditions. However, when it comes to the emergency department, we have a breadth of presentations. That includes things that I think we commonly think of being ACS, um, traumatic episodes, strokes, anaphylaxis, but even to ingestions or exposures, including snake bites. You know, that's something that we are tested on and expected to know. Um, every organ system is represented. Every specialty is represented. Um, with those breadth of presentations, we also have a breadth of patients. Every single person uses the emergency department from birth to death. Anybody can walk through that door and you are responsible for the care of that person that comes through. Um, which naturally leads me to kind of the last point of EMTALA, um, which is the legislation, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, which 
stipulates that if somebody walks into the emergency department, they have to have a medical screening exam, they have to receive stabilizing treatment, and then there are limitations imposed um, on who you can transfer from your hospital to another. I bring this up just because I think COVID really highlighted the aspect of this. Um, we were, I, I was the trained during the pandemic. I started before it started and trained all the way through the beginning and continue to train as it's going through, you know, but we were going into rooms when we were running out of personal protective equipment. You know, we had to come up with protocols on how do we protect ourselves as well as our patients. Always in the setting of worrying about taking home these diseases, these exposures to our friends and family and loved ones at home because we don't have the luxury of saying, no, I'm not gonna treat this patient or I'm not gonna see this patient um, because we have to. And that's a pressure that is quite frankly unique to the emergency department. So with that said, um, I hope that I've given you kind of maybe a general view or a lens that you can kind of appreciate some of these um, situations that arise in the emergency department. And I'd like to shift gears a little bit and um, go through a couple of cases and patients that I, I cared for in the emergency department that I felt had um, or highlighted different elements of palliative care that I've come to love and appreciate. Um, I will say that these are all real cases. Um, and so to give you kind of an outline of what I'm hoping to do is one, I'll start with just a presentation, give you some basic facts about the case. Um, from there, I think each of these cases have kind of a unique quality that, like I said, highlight um, a topic or a core um, foundational belief about palliative medicine that I'm hoping to kind of address to the group and get some of your thoughts. Additionally, um, I'd like to give you a few of kind of the emergency medicine considerations or elements of the case that might um, not immediately spring to mind from kind of our group or our perspective as palliative physicians. Um, these are all um, real cases. And so with that, I will go ahead and share the outcome, right? I will share the decisions that I made as the emergency physician and what actually um, ended up happening with the patients. And then each case, I think there's something kind of an, a unique learning point that resonated for me that I hope that I can share with you and, and here perhaps um, offer some resources that maybe um, you haven't seen or that you can um, go back and reference should these um, presentation, you encounter these presentations in the future. And so, for the first case presentation. Um, this was a 62 year old female with a history of COPD that was brought in by an ambulance with shortness of breath. Um, she was an extremist and she was speaking at max in three word sentences. She was posturing, she was somnolent. Um, I was really, really worried about her. But as we were getting ready to kind of set up and um, this was somebody who I felt needed um, intubation to get her through kind of this exasperation. She, the, the words that she would say, the three words she could say were no breathing tube. Um, and I remember being really worried about her because that was kind of, we're at a stage where this is the indicate, she has an indication and this is ultimately an intervention that would see her through this crisis. But she was very insistent. She was saying no breathing tube. And when asked why, kind of what I could get from her was I'm tired. Um, the thing that caused, I think, the most distress in our cohort was relatively young, but she also had a history of multiple intubations. Um, and with her most recent hospitalization, which I think had been the month before, she was a full code and intubation okay. Um, so Something changed, um, but one of the considerations or concerns that we had with this patient was, does she have decision-making capacity? In particular, this is a patient with COPD that is likely retaining carbon dioxide, and we know that um, with CO2 narcosis, you can have impaired mentation and questionable decision-making. 
you know, how do I make the determination that is this her disease process that's speaking or has she had a change in her goals? And so a larger question, I guess I'd love to pose to the group is what tools or methods do you use to assess a patient's ability to make informed decisions in the setting of limited communication ability? When your patient can only say two or three words at a time, how do you go about assessing and making these determinations? And so with that said, I would love to um, do just that. I, I apologize, I can't see the chat right now. So I'm gonna ask if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself. If anybody has some thoughts, I'd love to hear them. I'll monitor the chat for you, Matt. Thank you, Annie. <laughs> Matt, this is Stephanie. Did she look more comfortable on BiPAP? Um, so that is that is a consideration. Um, the only problem is one of the contraindications of BiPAP is that the patient has to be awake and alert um, because there's that risk of aspiration, right? With that positive pressure, if they vomit and it pushes back in and they aren't protecting their airway, you can cause more problems than, than not. Um, but I will say, Stephanie, put a pin in that thought because BiPAP is an option. I think something that can be reassuring in terms of assessing people's like capacity for informed decision making is like consistency in what they've been saying in their decision. So I would definitely have felt really challenged by this situation where it seems like there was like a change um, and it was and it sounds like it was pretty difficult to assess her like understanding of risk benefits. Yeah. Nora, <laughs> I completely agree. Um, so we highlighted, you know, the fact that she had been so consistent and now we have a different and a very clear different change, right? She was adamant, no, no breathing tube. Those are the, the, those were the longest, that was the longest sentence I could get out of this woman. And to see that departure really caused some anxiety um, with the emergency team. So other people in the chat agree with Nora and um, Gwen is asking, was a family member present to corroborate her statement? That is an excellent question. And no, no family was present. And uh, this particular patient, <laughs> we the, the family that was listed, the phone number didn't work. Um, well, thank you. you I, I think there's, I, I'm glad to know that the stress that I was feeling with this case is kind of shared amongst the people on the call today. Um, so I'm going to switch gears just a little bit here and provide maybe some extra context from the emergency perspective that was also happening. So um, one, I think we've kind of all addressed this, is why does she not want to be intubated? There's something, there is something here that's different. And unfortunately, she just was in a space that she could not articulate uh, why she, she, the only thing I could get out of her, as I had mentioned earlier, was I'm tired. I'm just tired. Um, conversely, I wanted to know, do you appreciate and understand the risk, you know, that I'm worried you are not oxygenating well, because of that, we're putting stress on your heart and your heart could stop and die. You could die. And I remember saying, spelling that out for her. She shook her head and I said, so is it okay if I place that breathing tube so that we can um, get the oxygen where it needs and keep you safe? And she would shake her head and say, no breathing tube. Um, to Stephanie's point, what treatment options are available? You know, if we can't do intubation, can we do non-invasive positive pressure ventilation being BiPAP? And we kind of talked about this, right? That there's a contraindication. This woman is not alert enough that she can safely support wearing BiPAP. Uh, we were curious, I was curious. I mean, what is her CO2 level, right? Um, one of my justifications was, is this CO2 narcosis? If her CO2 level was within the range that it normally is for her, um, kind of chronic retaining, maybe I'm placing too much emphasis on that physiological process. 
conversely, if it's extremely elevated, maybe that is the indication of what's driving this. You know, maybe that is the reason why she's having this decision. And so the question now becomes, what's your plan C? You know, you inaction is going to result, result in this woman's death. You have to make a decision. And so I'm going to pose it again to the group. Do you place the endotracheal tube? Sorry, again, I have another question. Yeah. Sorry, it's Stephanie again. Um, did you feel, I can turn my video on. Did you feel like she was in such extremis that if you were to try and do your typical um, decision-making capacity questions that she could do some writing or have some other kind of alternate form of communication? Or is it just, was it the shortness of breath or was it her um, being obtunded that was making communication? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Stephanie. Um, and it, it was exactly the latter point. Um, not only was she not able to make the words, but she was drifting in and out. She was somnolent, she was uptunded. Um, you know, I, I remember I was like yelling in her ear to try to just like keep her awake and to try to get, um, we, we even did try writing, um, but she couldn't even hold the pen in her hand um, to, to let alone write out a statement. Matt, I have a question before you kind of, before she kind of got to this point, did she receive any like small doses of morphine or anything to try to make her like slightly more comfortable? I know that's also very, very dicey in a patient who's actively having this, you know, COPD exacerbation and who's CO, you know, CO2 levels, you're probably like very worried about. Yeah. Um, yeah, Annie, we did not. Um, I think one of my concerns, um, especially with somebody who had previously been full code intubation okay, was I didn't want to suppress any of the drive that she had. Um, so no, she did not receive any, um, any opiates. Matt Wayne here, I got a question. Um, it, with regard to Stephanie's idea about non-invasive, you know, one's uh, not interested in doing it for days on end, it's really a matter of doing, a, you know, kind of a quick time trial, four or five minutes worth of non-invasive to see if she might perk up a little bit. Of course, yeah. the main problem is not inspiration, it's expiration. You can't, can't blow out mm -hmm. CO2, but it, it may be in the hope that it might perk her up a tad, just four or five minutes of non-invasive to see if she could, you could get a different or more, uh, clear response from her is an idea. But the other is, was there anybody at the bedside with you, a nurse or another doc? Sometimes others can help with consensus about what you're hearing. You know, if you if you saying, I think I'm getting that she doesn't want to be intubated and just kept comfortable. And if the nurse across the bed says, yeah, that's what she's saying, or, uh, you know, can back you up, because ultimately it comes down to your your courage, your, it, it takes courage to uh, embrace that you're just not gonna intubate her and just keep her comfortable knowing she'll die in the ER. Uh, that, that takes guts in a way, whereas uh, it takes a different kind of guts to go against what you're hearing and go ahead and intubate her. Maybe it takes more guts to not do it yeah. Yeah. Wayne, I think you're hitting right to the heart of it, right? Um, to answer some of the questions that you had posed, um, yes, when where I trained, you always had a primary nurse for every patient. Um, and for critically ill patients, they often would flex. Patients would, or nurses would come in to help. Um, I was a resident, so I was supervised by an attending. Um, so we had two physicians in the room. We all heard and we all agreed that she was making a very clear choice. She did not want a breathing tube and was consistent in that choice. I'm not gonna lie, I tried phrasing the questions, hoping I maybe would confuse her into saying yes <laughs> um, in that moment, because I, I think we were all just really concerned about what was driving this change. Um, I love your point about BiPAP. Um, I think 
and Stephanie brought this up too, but again, going back to that emergency mindset of what's your plan B, what happens if she doesn't perk up on BiPAP? It's coming back down to this question again. She's either going to need a tube to live or she's going to die without it. And so with this uncertainty of knowing, is this her disease talking? Is this the CO2 building up in her brain that's saying, that's altering her decision-making process? Or did she, has she just decided that she's done? And this is an intervention she will, does not find acceptable for her quality of life. And the clock is ticking. A decision has to be made. Matt, you have several um, comments from your fellow fellows in the chat. So um, Stephanie, Nora, and uh, Shoba all um, would intubate, um, mainly because um, they all agree that if you can't um, be certain about her decisional capacity, I think um, we're all kind of feeling, because I, I agree with them, you, um, you err on the side of life. And so even though I think on the other side of that, like Wayne was saying, um, you know, if a patient is telling you not to do something and they do have decisional capacity and you do it, I mean, that's, that's assault, right? So, um, but I think if, if we're not able to establish decisional capacity, your fellow fellows are erring on the side of intubating. Um, Nora, Stephanie, or Shoba, please feel free to unmute and add um, to that. I yeah. think that's all I think in terms of things that are reversible, you know, if you make a mistake and intubate somebody that's something you can reverse later. Um, but if you make a mistake and let somebody um, die that's something that you can't reverse so I guess yeah erring on life. Yeah. No, I, I agree, um, and I have with to not keep you guys in suspense. Um, the actual outcome of this I. I tried her, I trialed her on BiPAP. Um, I had the nurse in the room and I had the respiratory therapist. And I remember I said, you watch her like a hawk. And if there is any problem, you rip that off and we are going to intubate this patient um, was the decision that I made. Um, I remember I circled back to her multiple times as she was improving and asked her, you know, this breathing tube, you know, that will really help get the CO2 off that we can breathe you. And she remained consistent and just said, no, I do not want a breathing tube. She was ultimately admitted to the hospital. And during that admission, they were able to have a goals of care discussion and her code status was updated. Um, and she had just come to the decision that she did not want to go through that process again. Um, so I think this was a very fortunate outcome. Um, but I think you guys all hit that stress, right? <laughs> a decision had to be made and it didn't feel good to be the one that had to make that decision and to potentially violate what my patient was saying. Um, but operating on the information that I had, I felt like that was the best choice to be made. So, um, I think the learning point that I would like to kind of highlight for this um, particular case is about um, assessing patients' um, decision-making capacity. And this is by no means um, <laughs> an, an unfamiliar topic, but this is actually something that I learned um, on my palliative medicine rotation as a resident that I took back to the emergency department and was really well-received. Um, and for that decision-making capacity, you know, there are really four components. That understanding that a patient can grasp the fundamental meaning of relevant information communicated by the physician, an appreciation of the situation and its consequences, and acknowledging the medical condition and likely consequences of treatment options, including no treatment, um, reasoning, the, the, able to, or excuse me, the ability to engage in a rational process of manipulating the relevant, relevant information, and lastly, an expression of choice to be able to clearly indicate your treatment option. Um, so this is just a framework that I used in, um, to justify decision-making in the emergency department. I felt it allowed me to, it, I felt empowered to follow patient autonomy as long as these were kind of clearly documented and I could um, demonstrate that this was an element of the conversation that I had with the patient. Um, and like I said, when I shared it with my 
faculty in my residence, I, I started noticing that people were actually also documenting it in their chart or even saying it in their presentations. Um, so it's just a tool that really kind of grounded us that I, I, I hate to say the word stole, but uh, repurposed from palliative medicine. <laughs> And you have um, Mary in the chat empathizing with you, um, reminds her of a case she had as in the ED as a PA student. So happily, a very good outcome. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but like I said, I hope this to be a discussion. So if you have the cases and would love to share, I'd love to hear them. All right, um, and then this is just um, a really great paper that kind of talks about this, that spells out kind of that criteria, but also just some really balanced and nuanced discussion um, that I would draw your attention to. All right, um, I'm gonna jump into my second case here. Um, so this is actually a case that happened over the IHERN, which um, is the Indiana Hospital Emergency Radio Network. A part of being an emergency medicine physician is overseeing the care of patients in your department, but also liaison with, or excuse me, liaising with um, EMS in the field. And oftentimes you would receive calls asking for direction about a circumstance that was happening in the field. So this case was a 78 year old man that had an unwitnessed arrest. EMS had started compressions. They had placed a superglottic airway they had been coding this patient for 20 minutes and he remained in PEA arrest. He would actually had some advanced care planning and had his pulse form on the fridge like he was taught to do that said attempt resuscitation. However, after that 20 minutes, the family was asking EMS to stop resuscitating this patient. As you can imagine, there was a lot of distress from the EMS crew because the pulse form indicates attempt resuscitation and they felt that they had not done a full resuscitative effort, but they were really uncomfortable because the family was quite literally begging them to stop doing compressions for their, their loved one. And so they were calling um, for a physician, AKA Matt, <laughs> to say, do, you deter do we stop resuscitating this patient? I think the underlying question here is what would this patient want in this situation? And you guys know what I know. <laughs> this is the information that I got and I have to make a decision. So I would love to open it up to thoughts from the group. You have um, several questions. So Gwen asked, why did the team feel quote, they had not done a full resuscitative effort. And I actually had a similar question while you were reading this, um, what constitutes a full resuscitative effort? And then um, Kathy is asking, who is the decision maker, DPOA, legal next of kin? Yeah. yeah, these are great questions. Um, I don't think there is consensus about what is a full resuscitative effort. And so my consensus is, whoever is a part of this code, we all need to agree that we've done everything we can. And so when I run a code, before I call it, I will always ask for everybody in the room if they're comfortable. If somebody isn't comfortable and I am, and I'm worried that we're causing suffering, I, um, I will always just engage in a conversation. I personally, my practice style is I make that announcement during our last round of CPR, so I have two minutes. I have two minutes to see if I can't get everybody on the same page. So in this case, the team, the EMS crew felt that they had not given it their all. And so in my eyes, we had not done a full resuscitative effort. Um, Kathy's excellent question. Um, and I'm gonna just shift my slide here a little bit. Um, these are kind of the emergency questions that I was asking, right? Um, but who was present was a question that I wanted to know. Um, and in this case, the man's wife was one of the family members that was asking. Um, I was also curious, when was this pulse form completed, right? Um, I think this would be a different story if this was done two days ago versus six years ago, right? I think that adds some context. Um, as somebody who has to make this decision, I remember one of the things that came to my mind is, is there secondary gain from the family? Do I need to be the advocate for this patient um, because they're acting from ulterior motives? 
um, conversely, I was thinking, is this patient likely to survive? You know, they are in PEA arrest after 20 minutes and it was unwitnessed. And then the other outcome that I was really happy that I discovered um, here at UW as well as where I had trained was what is the best, worst and mo most likely outcome for this patient? And that was a framework that I anchored in. And so because I'm that annoying emergency medicine doctor who says that you have to make a decision, I'm really curious and I'm gonna pose to the group who, oops, excuse me, who's going to terminate resuscitation? Your EMS crew is waiting for a decision. Well, Wayne here, I'm, I'm gonna terminate. I'll call it. <laughs> Some, somebody, somebody on the team's always gonna feel like they didn't quite do enough when you call a code. Mm -hmm. And you have several um, folks in the chat too. Um, Grady Payton says stop with an exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kira Shriver says, that's a tough one. I think a spouse is often assumed to be legal next of kin when we know that isn't always the case. And actually, I would echo that. And, and that was my next question is, um, you know, we know there's a spouse there. Um, is, you know, is she, is there like a DPOA healthcare or somebody else um, hanging out in the wings? Um, <laughs> Gwen asks, how many more rounds was the team looking for? Um, and Megan says, I think the chance of meaningful recovery after 20 minutes of resuscitation is so low that I would focus on family suffering. Um, and Nora says, this is so difficult with a full code pulse. I would feel much more comfortable stopping if no pulse was done. And Shoba agrees with, um, with Megan. Um, Matt, was this in, in Colorado or Indiana or where? This was in Indianapolis. Okay, because <laughs> maybe not everybody knows this, but the surrogate decision-making law varies by state. It's different in every state. I, I see a lot of head, head nodding, so maybe that is common knowledge. But you know, up here in the Northwest, I mean, until pretty recently, Alaska had no surrogate decision-making law at all. Yeah. But, but they don't have laws about most stuff up in Alaska, including this. But, you know, it's good to know what the different rules are in different states. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, Wayne, you're stealing my thunder. So I'm going to just jump in a little bit. Um, to give you some context, I, you guys hit on exactly what my decision making process was. Um, at the end of the day, his wife, who in Indiana is his legal next of kin, um, was asking us to stop. And so that was the branch point that I needed and I was able to call the code. Um, of course, just again, my practice pattern, I checked in with EMS and they, they were okay as long as a physician um, had made the determination that they had done everything they could. And it, it sounded to me like they had. Um, and then unfortunately the patient passed away. Um, but the learning points from this case, exactly what Wayne was saying. I think it's always nice a refresher to remember that um, who is your healthcare agent? Who makes those decisions is codified in law and it, it varies state to state. Um, so this is just, of course, Washington. I think it's a really beautiful PDF. It's one that I've saved and I have um, readily accessible in my palliative fellow, <laughs> uh, palliative fellow file, excuse me. Um, the other thing that I thought was kind of interesting about this was the accuracy and surrogate end of life decision-making. And there is some literature review out there that surrogate patients agreed on CPR, just looking at CPR was only 72 to 79% of the time. Um, that, is, that kind of surprised me, to be honest. I expected, I think we kind of hold this, you are the expert, you know this person, and it's reasonable, but I would expect that, I was hoping that number would be higher. Um, the literature actually supports that if you look at global health decision-making, not just looking at CPR, but direction of care, surrogates actually fall below chance to be agreement with their, with the, the, the patient. Um, so again, if, you know, if we 
didn't already know that advanced care planning is important and what we do matters, <laughs> the evidence backs us up. You know, having these conversations early um, can really save you for these exact moments when snap decisions have to be made. So, of course, um, this paper was really interesting. It was a review of the literature that's out there, but I do want to temper that discussion by the fact that there's always questions about generalizability, right? And application to the patients that we're seeing in front of us. I think more than anything, it just highlights and things to be mindful of when we're talking about um, relying on surrogate decision makers. Um, yeah. I was just gonna say, excuse me. I feel like this highlights, sometimes I think, oh, doing a pulse is like, it's always good to have a pulse, but it, to me, it kind of highlights like, some of the challenges of, of like advanced care planning documents, if it's not, if family is not there, or if, if we don't really explain what CPR is, like I feel like sometimes like poorly done advanced care planning documents can be worse than like no advanced care planning documents. And I think I've complained to the other fellows about this, the number of um, pulse I've seen this year that say yes CPR and then like selective treatment no intubation that I've seen that frequently which does not really make any sense as a care plan so it's just it's interesting yeah I share your frustration Nora <laughs> what's um, interesting though is the patient you said kept the pulse on his fridge so presumably <laughs> his wife Hopefully knew his wish. I don't know. She was living there with the same fridge. <laughs> they had it posted. So I would hope they would have talked about it if it's like in plain view. But who knows? I mean, you know, I worked in a skilled nursing facility for many years and, and Wayne knows this too, but there are some kind of scary facilities out there that just keep a stack of pulse forms with the medical director's signature on it. And, you know, when patients come through, like they're being filled out um, without any discussion. And, you know, the patients just put their signature on it and check some boxes without, without really without any discussion. And there are pre-signed pulse forms, pre-signed by, by doctors. So it can be kind of scary. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I, Annie, I so agree with you. Um, and this is probably my bias, but I, you know, as an emergency medicine physician, I have coded hundreds of patients. Like I have seen these codes and they are traumatic. And I think, again, I have no way to prove this, but um, just in my experience, when family members see how traumatic these are, they oftentimes realize that that is not something that the patient would find acceptable. And so I have just noticed in my discussions with patients, that is something that I am very upfront and clear about, because you are agreeing to an intervention that is not benign. And you have a couple uh, comments in the chat. Gwen says, UW residents tend to announce when they are considering stopping resuscitative efforts soon. With prolonged PA arrests, there tend to be fewer interventions between pulse rechecks, leaving more time for team to reach consensus. Um, oh, I am so sorry. I am actually, I had a few more cases, but to be mindful of time, I'm going to space them out. I just wanna say thank you so much, you guys, for the engagement um, and bearing with me for making you put your chips down. It, it's really been insightful um, to hear kind of your decision-making process. Um, so with that said, I'm gonna jump to the end here um, and just share a few of my reflections. Um, I think, the emergency department is a really unique place, right? Um, and it impacts kind of the care and the interactions that we have with our, our, with our patients. Um, one thing in particular is death notifications. Um, I know that we have all had to do that um, kind of in our line of work. The one thing about the emergency department that has been different that I've kind of appreciated is oftentimes these are sudden, sudden and un unexpected. They are happening behind kind of closed doors because it happened so suddenly. Um, family members often aren't able to be at bedside or be with their family members. And that death can often feel hidden from them, um, which is kind of another layer of distress that we have to recognize and address when we're 
delivering that information to the family. Um, additionally, this was actually one of the cases we were going to kind of talk about, but we oftentimes have unidentified patients. We don't even know this patient's name, which means I have no personhood. I have no surrogate decision makers and decisions have to be made. And so this is a place that's really uncomfortable um, because inaction can mean death. And so navigating that space is something that's can have a toll on the provider. Um, did I make the right decisions? You know, that's something that we kind of have to live with in the emergency department. Um, and then last, just kind of reiterating, you know, emergency department is the front line, right? We're the gatekeepers of the hospital. Oftentimes we start patients on trajectories um, and that is kind of a, is a burden. <laughs> you, did you make the right choice? Did you set them on a track that they would ultimately appreciate? Um, I think you guys have probably all heard the term like jack of all trades, master of none, right? In the emergency department. But what that means is I take care of a patient, you know, um, a traumatic arrest that they didn't make it. I have to immediately walk out of that room, walk into a different room and bring my best self and take care of the patient that's in front of me. Um, it's just one of the hazards of the job you have to keep going because your patients need you. And I think that in that jest of jack of all trades, master of none, that, that is lost, right? You have, to, you have to deal with death all the way into that stub toe. And that's just a part of it. And how do you still be compassionate for that stub toe when you watch somebody unfortunately pass away in front of you? Um, I think one of the interesting areas of consultation with the emergency department, and as somebody who's kind of straddled both worlds, these are kind of just my own thoughts, but from the emergency department, that sense of urgency is something that should be cl pretty clearly defined. You know, is this consult something that needs to be done right now in the emergency department? Is this something that could wait as the patient is admitted? Is this something that could be done as an outpatient? Um, I think that's really kind of a heart of the question that we should address when we're talking to our emergency colleagues. Um, and also having their input on that situation is going to be really important. Conversely, from the palliative care side of the consultation question, I think my question becomes, do we have to have a full consultation, right? We, we pride ourselves that we can sit down and learn this personhood, have this informed decision-making process, but sometimes Maybe, the, is there a question that we can address very quickly that we don't have to go through the entire process to get an answer that leads to an important decision-making? I just pose it to the group, <laughs> thoughts to ruminate. And then lastly, um, in emergency medicine, I think there's a kind of a clear relationship between inpatient palliative services, but oftentimes that outpatient um, connection seems to be lacking, at least in my experience from both perspectives. And so what are the ways we can strengthen the pathways from the ED to clinic and vice versa? You know, that we can meet some needs um, that the patients are having that we're not addressing. These are some great, there's, this is an article about some tips to interact with your colleagues and the emergency physician. And then I'm just gonna end with this. Um, I made reference to this earlier, but a jack of all trades is a master of none. I'm actually gonna encourage you to finish the quote, which is often, but oftentimes better than a master of one. So the emergency medicine or the emergency department is this crazy, chaotic, beautiful place um, that has its wonderful challenges. But at the end of the day, extending a little grace goes a long way to your to your colleagues. And I don't really have time for questions, but I will be on here if anybody does. And thank you so much again for your engagement this morning. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, I think a lot of us really enjoyed your talk. Um, Shanitra is posting the link to the evaluation forms in the comments and Matt posted his QR code. So please fill those out um, as Matt is entering into his um, career as an attending. So <laughs> um, these are always great for the CV. Um, also, you have several more comments um, that Grady uh, 
but first of all, Gwen, since I think um, it's important to strive to reduce clinician moral distress, which I, I did want to um, give voice to that as well, because um, I've seen that a lot, especially in the hospital and patients that people don't want to code or don't believe, you know, will survive a code and we end up coding them for like an hour and um, everybody is traumatized afterwards um, and the patient doesn't survive. Uh, and Grady, uh, Grady says, I wonder about the perspective of an EMS provider whose intervention and skill set is doing CPR and that of a palliative care provider who might see things differently. I love your use of best, worst, most likely in this situation. And I'm just going to highlight, too, that your social work colleagues, um, Kira and Laura Waskowitz, who both did time in the ED as social workers, um, made some really wonderful comments as well. And Laura says there are many unknowns in the ED which can sometimes unintentionally cause or add a level of mistrust with the family. And I think that's a really, um, a really important point. And Kara says in the HMC ED, there's been a big push to bring families to bedside during codes if they want, so they can see the quote full court press that is being rolled out for their loved one. They had some research to back this up, um, but it's escaping me at the moment. And that's um, very true. Like there's been a number of studies um, that show that, you know, if you have a family member, um, it really just highlights, oftentimes the research has shown, it highlights, you know, that we are truly doing everything for the family member. So we used to think the reason why this research was done is because people used to worry that um, seeing a code would traumatize families. And so somebody actually did research on this, and it turns out that oftentimes seeing a code um, doesn't traumatize families, it actually allows them to see you doing everything you can for their, their loved one, and that actually builds trust um, and allows them to then tell you to stop um, because they're able to see that you truly did everything. And so I think I want to say the outcomes were like some reduced PTSD, actually, because our concern was that it would cause more PTSD um, and, and less regret and um, more peace. So um, thank you for these wonderful comments. Um, and Matt, I hope you can um, turn off your screen share and see some of the really great comments that you're getting for your talk. Thank you so much for that wonderful advice. <laughs> um, and again, thank you, everybody. I really enjoyed this morning. Hi, thank you, Matt.